um, <clears throat> when the World Trade Center was hit, it not only um, sparked all the things that we now know about, um, but it also started the, uh, the biggest um, evacuation of any building ever in history, at least that I know of. They had to get out more than you know, about 10,000 people. Um, and uh, as you might imagine, with all those floors and, and especially with the two buildings, they, they had people kind of moving towards the exits. And as you might imagine, it's a slow process. It's a long process walking down 100 floors, even if there's no smoke and there's not other people in the stairway, but you kind of add the chaos of what was going on and you start to find a certain kind of theme. So I spent the last couple of days reading summaries of the uh, thousand plus interviews that um, uh, that NIST uh, performed after the after the World Trade Center came down in 2001, and uh, certain themes appear. Um, NIST, of course, is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's a federal government agency, and so um, certain themes appear. And uh, one of the themes is that um, it just got tight at certain places. Um, uh, one of the themes is that it was hard because firemen were coming up at the same time that people who were trying to evacuate were going down. It was hard for the people going down. It was certainly hard for the firemen going up with their, uh, with their equipment, trying to go upstream uh, from all those people who were coming down. Um, what else? Um, uh, the process wasn't as uniform as you might think. Um, uh, there were a lot of people who uh, left right away, but there were a lot of people who stayed for a half an hour after the, after the plane hit, assuming it hit above them, and called their loved ones and tried to figure out what they were going to do. Um, so the average length of time between when the plane hit and when they started leaving was six minutes, although most people left within a minute. It's just some people stayed a lot longer than 30. Um, that's kind of surprising. Uh, what else was a little bit not obvious? Um, the there were a lot of people who kind of left and then came back, you know, in the interviews. So people maybe they left, but then they'd kind of think, well, maybe should I leave? And then they'd go back, you know, they get out of the emergency exit and they come back out. And there was a lot. There are these sky lobbies in the World Trade Center you may know about, and so every so many floors they had these kind of places where people would get out of the express elevators and get into the local elevator, taking them to the, you know, 10 floors above that. And so in these sky lobbies, people would kind of leave, they would come down into the, um, uh, they would come down into the, uh, uh, into the stairwell, the emergency stairwell, one of the three, and they would go to this, they would, they would just get out at one of the sky lobbies and they would kind of take the temperature of things, figure out what was happening, especially in tower two, which was the second one hit. So some of the people were evacuating from tower two after tower one was hit and they just kind of wanted to know what was going on. So they come out and ask. A lot of them took elevators, especially again in tower two uh, after tower one was hit, but before tower two was. So many of them took elevators, many of them took combinations where they take elevators to, you know, to the sky lobby and then maybe take the stairs down. You get the idea. It wasn't, it wasn't quite so linear. And it was nice to read a lot of people were just helping people. Um, uh, I mean, I don't mean anecdotally, but I mean, when they looked at the numbers of the, you know, the actual number of people who either were helping someone or were being helped, it was not insignificant. But, um, but mainly it just took a long time. It just took a long time. Um, uh, res uh, respondents to the surveys of the survivors, some of them, they would like go into a, a, a stairwell, it would become smoke filled, they'd leave and start looking for another stairwell and so forth. And so you have the kind of 50% uh, evacuated is the median. And so from the lower floors, it was about a half an hour. And from the upper floors, it was about an hour um, uh, on average, or, you know, the median. Uh, and then for, you know, where 75% were evacuated, um, uh, it was, you know, uh, well over an hour. And at 25%, it was a bit under an hour. But um, you get the idea. It took quite a while to leave. And the other thing was interesting is that um, the speed of people as they were leaving, and, and if you can't figure it out, this whole lecture is going to be about egress, this, the, and kind of what, what are the widths of, of part of the, you know, the egress paths? How do we figure out those widths? So the speed of the people as they were leaving 
uh, was very dependent not just on the uh, not just on the n number of people in the stairwell, but it was kind of usually based on the slowest person. So if there was a person who was injured or infirm, um, that was a big deal. And then also the elevators, uh, you know, it was 200 plus people, they estimate, died in the elevators, making it the, the greatest elevator disaster in human history as well. And that happened primarily because, it's a, you know, it was, it was the morning and people were coming to work. It was uh, you know, 8.45 for one of them, and I think 9.02 for the other. Um, and so people were coming up the elevators, and the um, and the planes, the planes that came in were cutting the elevator cables as the plane came in. And so um, hundreds of people plunged to their death, and the jet fuel from the, uh, from the planes went down the elevator shafts as fireballs, and then they started smoking. And uh, so some people probably perished in the elevators from burning, but a lot of people also in the lower floors their smoke exposure and their fire exposure was these fireballs of jet fuel, of flaming jet fuel that were moving uh, down the elevator. So um, uh, how did they know which stairwell to go? Well, most people chose just the closest one, 63%. Um, 20% um, followed other people. 10% were told which ones to use. And I should say there were a lot of interviews where people talked about the fire drill. So that particular building, because it no doubt was a, a target and b very difficult to evacuate generally, that particular building, there was just a lot more fire drills in that building than, than I think any other building I'm aware of. Uh, sometimes there were other exits blocked, but not that often. And a lot of people just didn't know which exit they went down or why they went down it. Um, so, And then there were these transfer hallways. So you'd go down some stairs and then you'd kind of cut over in a transfer hallway and then come back. And that was to make room for more, that was to make room for uh, mechanical equipment that were on some of the floors. So people would kind of slide over and then move down a few floors and then come back and then move down a few floors, you know, move down a few floors and then slide over and so forth. And so um, as with all the great fires, whether it be the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire or the Coconut Grove fire, each of these fires kind of has its own legend and a bunch of people pass away and perish, but um, then the fire code people try to plug up the hole that caused that problem. And this process has been wildly successful. There are about 40% fewer deaths uh, from fire now than in buildings now than there were in 1980. That's a huge number. Um, and, um, uh, um, and it's because at each step, at each kind of major catastrophe, we will change the code. So when the codes are changed every three years, so uh, 2003, 2006, 2009, and so forth. The 2021 codes are about to get released any day um, uh, because it's a multiple of three year. And whenever the codes get released, um, like in 2021, they're about to release the code for 2021, then NCARB for the ARE moves up to 2018. So moves up to the most recent code three years behind it. So NCARB right now is using 2015 codes or about any day to switch over to 2018 codes. So, um, uh, um, uh, so anyhow, there were a bunch of new proposals and many of them enacted for the fire code. And uh, most of them, frankly, had to do with buildings that are over 420 feet tall. So there are certain triggers in the code that trigger something different. So if a building is more than one story, that triggers a bunch of uh, uh, more acrobatics and more uh, uh, more um, bars that you have to clear to make your building meet code. If your build, if your room or building has more than forty nine people, uh, then a bunch of other things kick in. Um, if your building is uh, uh, sprinklered, a bunch of things. Uh, uh, if your building is not sprinklered, I guess to keep it consistent and parallel. If your building is not sprinklered, a bunch of other. Um, you have to jump through a bunch of other hoops. What is the maximum length of travel from the far corner of the conference room? So this point right here um, to the conference room door. So to this point right here. So what is this distance in here? Um, and you can go ahead and use that same code. Uh, you can Google upcodes chapter 10. So go ahead, we'll reunite in four minutes.
All right, so the answer is that this whole line is going to be 100 feet. So the distance to the door is 100 feet minus whatever that distance is till the point where you have two choices. So what we're really trying to figure out is what is the distance from uh, from the farthest corner of the room to the point where you can either go this way past the reception room or this way down the hallway. That's our that's where we're trying to find that's what the number is that you find on the chart. And again, we're going to go back to that same chart where we say, okay, we have a, a business occupancy um, and we have uh, um, uh, our maximum common path of egress tra travel in feet. And so this is without a sprinkler system and this is with a sprinkler system. And you'll see that often the limit is 75, 75, 75, 75, 75, 75, 75. That's kind of our rule of thumb is 75 feet when in doubt. But uh, in our case, because we have a sprinkler system and we're business, business sprinkler system, we can do 100 feet. We can do 100 feet. So that's going to be our, um, that's going to be our, 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 um, our maximum to here. And then I don't know, maybe it's about, looks like it's about 12 feet um, in the hall, in the corridor. So maybe it's 88 feet or something in the corner. Now, those of you guys who are savants at reading the, uh, at reading the size of the, reading the size of, of a plan um, might note that the, the way we have it drawn here, it's about 140 feet. Um, because our conference room is big. We went, we made our conference room, just under 4,900 square feet because it was 100 feet gross. So we made it 4,800 square feet and that distance then just winds up ha happening to be about 140 feet the way we have it drawn. So the, um, that particular limit, the limit to the point where we have two ways of getting out, that's gonna in some ways limit the size of our conference room. Now in reality, it wouldn't have to, we could, put a second set of doors in the conference room to uh, we could put a second set of doors in the corridor down here we could um, uh, we could even if it's a one-story building like we said one of the problems we could just put a, a door out here um, uh, going straight outside from the conference room so we have lots of other options if we have to but um, we have a limit as to how far we can go before we have a choice and that limit is a hundred linear feet in this particular case. All right. All right, now our next problem that we're gonna to do together, um, we have a one-story office building, same, same building as before. It has exits here and here, and we have this kind of dead and it's sprinklered and we have this dead end corridor right here. And the question is, what is the maximum length of our dead end corridor and you can use the same code link to answer that. So I'm gonna give you four minutes again. It's now uh, 6.30, you'll have till 6.34.
All right, so um, uh, let's explore this one. So what you're gonna do if you're in the exam is you're not gonna scroll through until you find the part on dead ends. You're just gonna search for dead um, because you can, you know, the, the life safety code is all about not making you dead, but you can bet they're not gonna have the word dead a lot without end after it. So you're gonna search dead and you're gonna come up with this. And so it looks, even this looks kind of daunting because it's very in legalese uh, for some of you. Uh, but for some of you, like I said, you deal with this every day, so it's like the easiest thing. But um, it says where more than one exit or exit access doorway is required, the exit access shall be arranged so there's no dead ends in corridors more than 20 feet. So you say, okay, it's 20 feet um, in length. Then there are the exceptions. So in occupancies group I3, and remember, um, group I is like institutional, for, so that's things like prisons and hospitals, and so that's where you have a heart. People who can't get out on their own, um, um, then we might uh, we might have a, uh, an exception there. And then in occupancies in group B, well, that's us, where the building is equipped with an automatic sprinkler system. Oh, that's really us. Um, the length of dead end corridors cannot be it cannot exceed fifty feet. So 20 feet is, you know, and, and, and of course there's lots of exceptions, but if you're gonna memorize anything, memorize 20 feet for unsprinklered and 50 feet for sprinklered, knowing that this and everything I'm talking about has exceptions, lots and lots of exceptions. Now our final one is gonna be right here. Um, and so the question here is, what is the most the door can encroach into the corridor? So when this door opens, of course, it's into the corridor. And what's the most it can encroach into the corridor and still maintain the corridor's proper egress clearances? So go ahead and search your code. You have four minutes to search your code for that one. And so for the code, you can go ahead and search chapter 10 of the IBC. All right, so this may be worth memorizing. Um, so we have two different uh, categories and three different means of egress. So the two different categories are sprinklered and unsprinklered, which we'll call NS for not sprinklered. And the door for sprinklered is, I did it wrong before, I did it as point two. Uh, the door for sprinklered is going to be uh, let's see, it's going to be um, 32 inches minimum, which is really 36 inches for the width of the door, including the hardware. Um, and it's, or it's going to be a minimum of 0 0.15 times, um, uh, times the number of people. 
so that's going to be our minimum width for the door, whichever of these is greater. Now, either way, it wouldn't matter in the case of the last problem we went under over because 32 inches is the one that controls. For not sprinklered, it's also going to be a 32 inch minimum. And the door width is going to be 0 0.2 times the number of people in inches. That's our width. Okay, so whichever is whichever is greater. For a corridor, it's going to be a minimum of 44 inches if it's sprinklered, or it's going to be 0 0.2 times the number of people. Now, obviously, all of these have exceptions. This is kind of our baseline. And generally, the code questions in the exam are not asking. They may ask you for exceptions for sprinklered or unsprinklered or um, for your particular occupancy type, but they're not gonna say, oh, you have, you know, there's exceptions in the code for all kinds of, you know, you, oh, you're storing sod. And if you're storing sod, you get, you know, you can have, if you're storing sod, you can have a mezzanine that's 50% greater than if you're not storing sod. I'm making that up, but it's stuff as ridiculous as that. Um, but uh, for a not sprinkler corridor, again, our minimum is 44 inches. And our corridor width is going to be 0 0.3 times the number of people in the corridor. And for a stair, it's also going to be 44 inches as our minimum. You'll, you'll start to see patterns. Um, and 44 inches, whether it's sprinklered or not, we'll never get lower than 44 inches. Of course, we will if we have fewer than 49 people or for residential, there's ways to get down to 36 inches. But for the most part, for our purposes here, we're going to say 44 inches. And our stair is going to be 0 0.2 times the number of people if it's sprinklered or if it's unsprinklered, it'll be 0 0.3 times the number of people. And sprinklers are remarkably effective in preventing deaths and fires from spreading. So our question here is, how far can this guy, can these doors go out into the, into the um, corridor? Well, let's say that there are just, let's do an example because it's always easier if you do an example. Let's say that there are 240 people that are heading down that corridor there at that point. That seems high, but maybe there's some more, there's a reason I'm doing that. Maybe it's because it's a nice even number. Because when we multiply that 240 times 0.2, we realize that we have a corridor minimum width of 48 inches. So it's a nice clean four feet. So it's 48 inches wide, or wide, the corridor has to be. So the question is, how far can our door intrude into that space? Because we don't want people to hit the door when it's all, you know, say you open the door to the conference room, we don't want people looking down at their phone and hitting the door every day. But we also don't want, if it's a, everyone's running for the exits at once, we don't want the door to be an unnecessary and, um, and you know, kind of hegemonic um, choke point. We don't want it to be, uh, an undue choke point. It can choke a little, but it can't choke all the way. So, so uh, if we have a three foot door, because we figured out before we need a 36 inch door, then our three foot door is going to go three feet into this four foot wide corridor. So we have a four foot wide corridor and a three foot wide door, and it's only going to let one foot go by. And that's a no, no. And actually, that's a pretty common problem, where if you have doors that are swinging outward into a corridor from uh, some space that has a bunch of people like the conference room, you see that um, that some of these uh, rooms can have the doors swing in. But if you have a bigger room and you need the so doors to swing out, <clears throat> um, we need to make sure that the uh, we need to make sure that the door does not interfere when it's at its most choke pointy. When it's at at no point can the door eliminate more than half of the required width. So if the required width is forty eight inches. Um, and we need to make sure that we are not blocking half of that, then we have to make sure that there's at least 24 inches going by. So what is a boy to do? How do we deal with that? Well, we really have two common solutions. Um, one is we can make the corridor wider. So if we make the corridor five feet wide, um, then we can have our 36 inch door swing open and it will block three feet but that will still leave two feet. And because we need four feet and we've left two feet clear, we're in, we're okay, we have a green light. Um, the other option is we can recess the door and you've seen it a million times. You've seen it a million times, it looks something like this. 
where you have a corridor and you have doors and those doors are kind of tucked into recesses. And there are a couple of things you have to know about that. One is that will get the door out of the hallway, but there's a second issue. Um, we don't, we, the, the second rule is if the door is all the way open, if it's propped all the way open, we don't want the door ex, uh, coming into the stairwell more than seven inches. And I think that's just for everyday people walking by looking at their phones so they don't bang into a door. And certainly people who are, uh, uh, who have trouble with sight uh, from ADA, um, but maybe it's also for egress in a fire. But if the door is all the way open, that seven inches should allow us to, if we have a flush situation like here, that seven inches should allow us to open our door all the way. And uh, um, with the normal kind of hardware, we should have enough clearance that we're not into the hallway by, you know, by uh, seven inches, by more than seven inches. Now, you remember we were cutting into our corridor by three feet, and we wanted to make it so we were only cutting into our corridor by two feet. So you would think we just have to push this thing one foot back. But actually, once we put it in here, then all the way open becomes kind of here. And then we don't, once it's all the way open there, it can't, it can't go in the corridor more than seven inches. So whereas when it was flush, we could open it all the way and we could kind of get it out of the way. Once we put it in a niche like this, we have to put it deep enough that when it's all the way open, it doesn't cut into our, our path of egress more than seven inches. That's our limit. So it can't cut our path of egress by more than 50%. And at any point, at any point in its swing, and when it's fully open, it can't cut our egress by more than seven inches. All right. Well, it also has the added advantage of, you know, these are kind of nice, frankly. <laughs> these are, from an architectural point of view, I'd rather see this and kind of allow a, a moment to, before you go in your classroom than to have the door flush with the lockers um, and, uh, and not have a place to kind of, you know, regroup your thoughts um, uh, out of the middle school uh, hallway before going into the, before going into the, um, um, uh, before going into the, the classroom. Now, I hadn't really thought of it until just now, but these lockers themselves probably open up more than seven inches in. Uh, so maybe they're allowed to. All right. I guess the assumption is the lockers aren't going to stay open while someone's walking down the hall looking at their phone. For next week, for next week, um, you're going to take this topo. So what you can do is you can wait for us to send you the um, uh, the email with the topo. And if you're not on our e email list, email firms at amber-book.com to get on our, our weekly email list. Um, uh, so you can wait for us to send you this, or you can take a screenshot, or you can take a phone photo um, so that you can start working before we send it to you if you'd like. But this is our, our topo. And uh, uh, next week, we're going to learn how to read topos so, uh, and rework them. So rework the topography to allow for the site of the house. Uh, specifically to allow for proper water path, uh, kind of surface rainwater path flows uh, around the site, around the house. All right. Now, from last week, there were a couple of questions, and one was about the difference between a tieback and a deadman. Uh, a de so these are tiebacks, right? So, for if you have a retaining wall, you don't have a roof, or you know, a ceiling or a roof that will kind of you know go across here, oops, across here and be supported on another wall. So there, there's this overturning moment from all this soil back here. So we need to resist this overturning moment. And we do this one way we can do it is with these things, which are called tiebacks. So the tiebacks are like the bolts and they're gonna go into the ground. Now, either they're gonna go into the ground with some kind of a helical uh, screw at the end, if the uh, soil is stable enough to resist, they're just gonna screw into the ground uh, just like a wood screw will screw into a, uh, a deck. Um, but um, if the soil isn't sufficiently uh, compacted or sufficiently resistant, um, then we may have to have these cementious or grouted uh, trenches, these kind of uh, holes where we're going to put concrete in or, or grout in, and then we're going to set the, uh, we're going to set the tie back into that. Now, these things are called dead men. So the, the, the bolt is called, the giant bolt is called a tieback and the, uh, the grouted sleeve uh, is called a deadman. And so it's, uh, it's, they kind of work together. The other question I got, I got by email this week um, 
Uh, I have a request. I joined the M the NCARB we NCARB webinar on eleven seventeen, which was about ARE testing strategies, and it's not clear for me what cut score is. Would you please do us a favor and ask Michael to explain about cut score? So, a cut score is the score you need to pass. So it's how many questions right do you need to pass? And so um, they have a sense, NCARB has a sense, they do a lot of statistical mathematics to determine what is the appropriate cut score. They do things like they will give it to people, they will give the test, new versions of the test. They will give, so if they have a new version of the test like they're about to come out with, um, they will give that test to folks who just passed the test and they'll see how they do because that it should be that whatever their score is should be enough to to um uh, to get you licensed if they're licensed so they'll use that to establish the cut score and um and they'll use uh, other metrics and so because the test is about to go uh, allow you to go in uh, in uh, at home and it's about to get shorter they need to come up with a new cut score because it's now a different test length and it's different testing experience even though the content is still the same. So the cut score, uh, uh, it, may, it may go one way, it may go the other, but they have their psychometricians who are like math people who determine um, exactly what an appropriate threshold is beyond which you pass the exam. Um, I have a question. Um, on doors uh, and egress, what triggers the fire rating on the doors? I know uh, Incidental use is one of them, and like exit stairs are another one. But uh, if if I come across like I'm trying to study more, like focus on that topic. So what section of the code, or what do you recommend looking at? Um, I think it's also in chapter ten, but I'm not sure. Maybe someone could put it in the chat. Probably is. Knows. But I, I is hate. Is there a email. chart? You think? What's that? Do you think there's a chart that kind of like? Um, yeah, actually, I actually saw some stuff on that um, this week. Um, you're talking about when do you need a fire rated door? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, generally, there are all kinds of reasons you don't um, uh, need a fire rated door to the exit, which is the stairway, basically. Right. Um, it can be open. Um, I think I saw it. I was looking a lot. At, it was in chapter three and chapter or chapter 10. I was looking at both of those quite a bit this week. And I'm pretty sure it was in chapter 10. Okay. You can you can take a look. I, it's all the reasons you might think. Right. So it's like. Um, uh, it's like if there's not that many people, if it's not that hazardous, if it's not that many floors um, above ground, those were, I think, the reasons you could get away with not having that, but I'm not sure. I always hate opening it up to questions when we're doing code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because as you can imagine, it's like, oh man, you know, there's two, there's three things going on. One is I don't do code every day, so it's always required. I don't have it in my, in my, in my immediate recall the way that many of you do. The second mm -hmm. is, um, uh, I'm always a little bit nervous uh, saying anything like that and something that's going to be recorded because Lord, I wouldn't want you to do it wrong because I, mm -hmm. I you know, I said it and, and it should be obvious to you guys that, that all these, you know, the kind of chart I ran and stuff like that, all these things are, are kind of for many cases, but they're not for all cases, not even close to all cases. The, the exceptions are so numerous. It's like, it's like learning French when you're learning the code. Um, I would ask everyone who knows the code, uh, okay. really well to be less smug when you're talking to your colleagues who don't know the code that well. I and find that there's a, there's a certain kind of code, uh, code among, uh, maybe code's the wrong word to use code two, two different ways, but there's a certain kind of habit that folks who know the code really well will do to especially the younger people in their office who are less experienced and they will make them feel stupid for not knowing the code. And if you're a younger person in your office and somebody is making you feel stupid who's older, not making you feel stupid for not knowing the code, then I encourage you to do the same to them when they don't understand the software. For sure. Um, also, um, I think the on, on egress, the there is it's 0.3 and 0.2 for stairs, and then uh, anything other than stairs is 0.2 and 0.15, right? Doors and corridors included. I'm pretty sure corridors are 0.3 or 0.2, but you guys can uh, write in the in the um, write in the uh, um, the chat if I'm wrong. Okay. I'm pretty sure the 0.15 is just for now. There may be some there. You know, I also saw some 0.15s in there for like I think residential or something like that. So there are other um, there are other exceptions. So let's just go ahead and say that it's 0.15, 0.2, or 0.3. Um, we'll just go ahead and say that. Um, and so again, if you're searching a code, 
you can, and you're looking for the right thing, you can search for 0.15 and you can see if it's in the excerpt they give you. And if it is, you can then see, does that apply to what you're looking at? And almost for sure, there'll be a 0.2 and a 0.3 somewhere in that same paragraph. Uh, so you can find it there. Hey, Michael. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay, so I actually had two questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay, so first question I had is, um, you know, I'm always getting a little bit tripped up between a clear width and the size of a door. Right. And so uh, in regards to the in-carb testing, um, do you think that they will use oh. words like clear width and door, or do we need to know that rule of thumb that there's two inches on either side to add four inches to the clear width that's to a get a point. door size? That's, that's a good question. <laughs> In my experience, um, even the bad end carb questions somehow have that have that worked out. Um, so they'll have you know they they will they won't have thirty two inches as a choice. So they'll have thirty six and thirty or something like that um, because that is confusing. It's especially confusing because so if you I think you understand this, but you have a in plan you have an opening for a door and then you have a door itself which when fully opened still has the, this width between the uh, jam of the door and the edge of the door for things like the hinge and uh, for the thickness of the door itself. And so that's why a 32 inch clear, which is here to here, means a 36 inch door. And that's very confusing, made more so because if we're talking about a stairway and they need a and you need say a 44 inch clear stairway, they don't count your handrails if the handrails don't protrude more than four inches. So in a stairwell, you can go the full wall to wall. So if this is your stair, um, you can, let me draw that a little better. If this is your the, if this is your stair in plan, um, and your and your handrail is here. As long as your handrail doesn't come in more than four inches, you can count the full width of the stairwell. So I think that's um, I think that's probably unfortunate <laughs> that they did that. <laughs> um, but um, know that generally um, you're going to get if you're not familiar with code, you're likely to get one or two wrong. And I just don't recommend. Well, okay, there's two different answers, right? I, I recommend kind of going through the stuff that's most important, which we're covering a lot of it here on 40 Minutes of Competence. I certainly covered all in the Amber book course. So I think it's worth being familiar with a lot of it. Um, I think it may be worth being familiar with just so you're, you can be one of those people in your office who's really smug. Um, there's a story about uh, Cesar Pelli, who apparently had just an identic memory. He can remember everything he reads. And at a young age, he read the code and knew it better than anyone else in the office. And that's how that's how he was able to get control over a lot of the designs in the office was he knew the code better than anyone else. So I think there's actually probably a pretty good professional and design reason to learn the code. But from the point of view of this exam, it is not a great use of your time to memorize these exceptions, even if you had an exception on a previous exam because you had 100 questions on that exam. You probably had one weird exception. And it's the chances are almost zero that you're going to have that same exception next time. So you're going to spend a lot of time trying to learn one. And if you have an exception next time, it's going to be a different exception. Um, so that's that's my advice to you. Gotcha. And the, um, the second one I had too, I, you know, I think you had pointed it out earlier, but I, I had missed it uh, on the question was I had used um, assembly space and used uh, seven net. And so I was just kind of curious if you could just repeat that. Um, yeah, if you, why we if, ended up using assembly, not assembly and used uh, business area. Okay, not in the not in the link I sent you. But in if you Google, if you if you go to uh, if you Google, I think like North Carolina code or IBC North Carolina, or, you know, building code of North Carolina, or building code of Virginia, one of those two I saw this week, um, it has a little B. <laughs> Um, next to the um, uh, next to the next to the business space or something, and if you click on the B, it takes you to it. If you, if you look at the B, it takes you to an uh, to a footnote, and that footnote will take you to uh, uh, somewhere in chapter three, and that somewhere in chapter three <laughs> uh, tells you that if you have fewer than forty nine, I think, um, people in your conference room, 
it will count as a business classification and not as an assembly classification. So it's one of those many, many exceptions that I don't want you to be stressed about for the exam, but it's probably worth knowing if you design office interiors. Gotcha. I'll keep that one in my pocket. Okay. Thank you, Michael. All right. I have time for one more. Hi. Um, just a question. Hi, Michael. It's Grace. Um, on the corridor, right? Um, just maybe I'm thinking about it too much, but is accessibility need like a five foot turning right eye? Uh, but the minimum corridor width is 44 inches. Yeah, that's a really good question. Can somebody chime in on the chat or maybe I'll talk about that next time. Um, I have time for another question because I don't know that one off the top of my head. Okay. Hey, Michael, it, it was only back. seven inch encroachment, right? Seven inch encroachment on, when it's all the way the, open. On the, when on it's the all 40. the way open and no more than, you have to still allow half the minimum. You can encroach into half. more than half the corridor, but you can't, you still have to allow at least half the minimum that's required for that particular corridor. Okay, so it was 44 for that corridor? That corridor happens to be 48. Um, but it's 44 okay. minimum. It's 44 minimum for a corridor. That corridor that I drew, that example, because we had 240 people and we were sprinklered, happened to be 48 inches wide, just so I could make it a clean four feet. So the trick is you can still go three feet into the corridor. If the corridor is five feet, that's more than halfway into the corridor. But the corridor has to be four feet wide and you're still allowing two feet clear. And so that's why you're okay. Got it. Okay. Thanks. It's confusing, right? Yeah, code this is, is this stuff is hard. But it's and it's um it's wordy. It's it it's, is wordy. You like have to understand. <laughs> it is wordy. I mean, I what I want to do, if any of you guys have ever used like TurboTax, what they do for TurboTax is they, you know, they ask you a bunch of really simple questions, <laughs> but a lot of them. And each question you kind of go to the next, you go to the next um uh, you go to the next question, you know, but, you know, they'll say like, did you buy a solar powered boat this year? And you say, no, I didn't even know that was in the tax code. And you say no, and it asks you the next question. And the next question, it says, um, did you have at least $150,000 in real estate losses this year or whatever? Um, I assume at some point, and I think that's already actually happening. I think a, a startup got some money to do this and it may even be available. I think Upcodes might be the people who did, but um you can imagine a scenario where this becomes much more software based where and it's starting to get that way now and if any of you guys have experience with this maybe you can write me um but um you know it, that's that was always the promise of revit and the promise of revit is that you would give up uh some of your uh some of your ability to design properly um and i by properly i mean you pretty much take what was a wide open essay question and turn it into a multiple choice question the way the Revit does, the way that BIM does, but then they would be able to give back to you all kinds of information, you know, oh, by the way, your door's not wide enough. Um, and so I don't know if we're there yet, uh, you guys have to let me know. But if Revit knows that it's a conference room and Revit knows that it's be occupancy and Revit, you know, if it's essentially, uh, if you're, if it's you're drawing, not there yet. <laughs> yeah, if you're draw if you're drawing to me and it's been a while, right? I mean, Revit's been around, BIM's been around and kind of taken over the world, you know, 11, 12 years ago. If your drawing is essentially a spreadsheet, um, then it should be able to tell you in real time. If you make a choice, it should tell you how that impacts that there should be a little, uh, there should be a little window in the corner that's telling you your EUI. In other words, how many BTUs per hour per square foot your building's using. So if you enlarge the window, your EUI goes down and you say, oh, I didn't realize it was going to go down that much. And then you put a shading element on the window and it goes back up and so forth. Same with cost and same with code. I mean, we're at a point where if we're telling the computer all this information and, and not, no longer just like with AutoCAD, if we're no longer just drawing a line, it seems to me that if it knows it, this is not like crazy, you know, crazy stuff that it could figure it out. But, you know, that's me. No, that's a really good point. And it's definitely not giving information out. It's just, sometimes it helps um, make yeah, Ger things and Gerald proper. Just, and Gerald just put on the, the chat a, um, a link to, uh, it is upcodes, I guess. Um, a link to upcodes apparently has an AI feature that's supposed to know what you're oh. doing. 
that you could add it to the, your Revit model? They're calling it a spell check for compliance, uh, available for 2019 and 20 Revit. Oh, wow, I gotta try that, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, if you go, if you go, it, AI is here, man. If you go to your, if you have an iPhone and you click on photos or, you know, we click on all photos, and there's a little search bar and you can search Kentucky to see, you know, the, the picture when you were at Kentucky at that pizza parlor, but you can actually search for pizza and it will know that it will pull all the photos of in your, in your uh, library that have a slice of pizza or a pizza on it. it you could search bottle. And, you know, if you take, if you like taking pictures of good wines um, in case you want to, you know, buy it next time, it knows that now too. So, we're at the point now where um, things know stuff. So I think a lot of stuff is about to change. It'll be kind of fun. All right, now I do have time for one more because I didn't know the answer to that one. But you'll get back to us? I, next week. Next week okay. I'll cover the, the whether, uh, whether a corridor has to be five feet wide. Yeah, just a thought. I don't know, thinking too much. Thank you. You're welcome. Michael, I just want to point out that uh, the new um, exam coming out on the uh, 14th will be referencing uh, 2018 IBC. I did mention that. Yeah. So the, yeah, the, thanks. the new, the new test will be 2018, but again, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't because it's so unlikely that something's going to change that the thing that you're looking for is going to change between 2015 and 2018 and um, and that the thing that you're looking for isn't in the, the table that they're going to give you. So you don't have to memorize this. Generally, you don't have to memorize the code. It's going to be in the reference that they give you as part of the case study. So I just don't recommend worrying about the year of the code that you're studying. I think it's fine to study 2015. I don't think that's a problem at all. Uh, let me rephrase that. I think if you have a, a yield focus, in other words, if you're trying to get the most extra points with your next hour of studying, and uh, uh, then I, you know, I mean, if all things being equal, might as well study 2018. But if you're already familiar with 2015, I would not spend any time learning 2018 for this test. You can learn 2018 because it's worth learning, but I wouldn't learn it for the test if you're already familiar with 2015. All right. Thank you guys. Good night. Get licensed. <laughs>